subscribe the channel and press the bell icon so that you do not miss any update from Rao's IS. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an initiative by Rao's IS Study Circle where we try to customize the information that is given in the Hindu into something that you can use for UPSC civil examination. Today we are going to analyze the Hindu dated 15th of July. The news items which are covered in this DNS are displayed on the screen. Let's begin our analysis. Dear students, we have a very important announcement for you. If you are looking for guidance for optional program, Rao's IS Bangalore Centre is conducting its optional counselling on 24th of July. This will basically be talking about four optional subjects, Geography, Public Administration, History and Sociology. So please note the time and there is a link in the description which you can utilize for the purpose of registering for these sessions. Now as far as these sessions are concerned, Optional orientation for geography will be taken by Indrajit sir and this will be conducted on Sunday 24th of July 10 am. Now these optional orientations are live online and you can attend these sessions online. Next is public administration. This will be taken by Anubhav Sharma sir and the sessions timing are Sunday 24th of July 12.30 pm onwards. Next is history which will be taught by Parampreet sir. The optional orientation will be taken on Sunday 24th of July from 3 pm onwards. And sociology will be taught by Mr. Vikram Kaushal again on Sunday 24th of July from 5.30 pm onwards. So if you are someone who is looking forward for optional orientation in these subjects, these sessions are must attend for you. Do not miss them. Enroll for these sessions through the link in the description. Aspirants, a very important aspect, uh, weekly assignment question for main answer writing is live on Rao's IS eLearn platform. Please attempt this question. The question is, Indian banking has seen many frauds or scams in the recent past and this has eroded the confidence of depositors. Identify the reasons for scam, fraud and suggest measures to improve the situation. Now this particular topic is based on the discussion that we have done on 12th of July and you can actually refer to that particular discussion as well. Based on that, you can write great answers. So do not forget to attempt this question. Alright, so we will begin today's discussion with a very very important topic appearing on page number 7. How to grease the wheels of justice. In which the two authors try to convince us about the level of pendency in today's judiciary. They just do not come up with the statistics with respect to the pendency as you can see in this chart. But they also try to explain the reasons behind the level of pendency in India's judicial system. And mind you, this level of pendency is just not limited to the lower court or high court or at the apex level supreme court. The high level of pendency is being observed at all three levels of India's integrated judiciary. Now if we talk about UPSC syllabus or the reason why we are discussing this news is because of your GS paper 2 syllabus. Structure, organization and functioning of the executive and judiciary. And so it is expected of you to be aware about one of the most important issues plaguing Indian judiciary which is judicial pendency. Now it is not surprising that when it comes to judiciary, one movie dialogue Tariq Pe Tariq from the movie Damini hits our mind the first thing. And so not just from the perspective of civil services examination but from the perspective of a common citizen to be aware about the pendency, its causes. How does a pendency impacts a common person's social, political and economic life? And what are the solutions which we have to offer in order to resolve this problem? are the important aspects which we are going to cover in next 15 to 16 minutes. Let us now begin the discussion. And so let us begin by first understanding the current status of the pendency in our judicial system. This graph has been given in the article itself and so we will begin from there itself. If you look into the total pending cases in our court system, it was 292 lakhs or around 2.92 crore in 2006 which increased to 449 lakh cases in 2021. Forget about the disposal of old cases, we have added 2 crore new pending cases in last 15 years. And if you look into just one year, we have added 51 lakh new cases and in past 6 months, we have added 23 lakh new cases. So you can see the staggering level of pendency being created year on year, decade on decade through our court system. And this data has been taken from National Judicial Data Grid, 
which is very informative portal not much used to upsc aspirants but this is a good development which our judiciary has done it has compiled all the cases and their stages where they are pending and it presents the data through very very informative infographics as you can see and so for example if you have to know about age wise pendency of the cases you can see that most of the cases are in green color which are around 0 to 1 years old so the cases less than 1 year old or few months old are around 33% but there are certain cases which are as old as 30 years there are cases in purple color which are around 5% of all the cases which are 10 to 20 years old and so you can easily understand how slow our judicial system has been, especially in resolution of cases. For instance, a law commission report in 2009 had quoted that it would require 464 years to clear the areas with the present strength of judges. And so when we talk about such high numbers of pendency, of course, we have to understand the causes behind such high levels. Of course, the judges do not want this pendency. And the government of course does not want this level of pendency and so the number of cases pending should actually come from structural and institutional problems of our judiciary and so let us understand those causes which actually cause such high level of pendency and so whenever we talk about the reasons behind judicial pendency these are eight reasons which we often come up with shortage of judges, low budgetary allocation to the judiciary, special leave petition process for Supreme Court, lack of functional court management system, frequent adjournments in cases, burden of government cases being too much high, inefficient investigation on behalf of the police, and increasing level of literacy of the citizens. So these are the headings under which you need for the materials. And so we will begin with shortage of judges. And so to give you a data, Around 5,000 or 25% of the posts are lying empty in the subordinate courts. And so when you have such high levels of vacancy at the subordinate court level, which is the third tier and also the first layer of interaction with the complainant or the defendant, you will obviously end up with very high level of pendency, especially at the district level. And so of course, it results into very, very poor judges to population ratio. If you know, India has only 20 judges per million population, whereas the Law Commission has recommended optimum level of 50 judges per million. And so you can easily understand, we have to at least go for doubling the number of judges at the lowest level of judiciary if we want to reduce the pendency in a very, very timely manner. Then shortage of judges is just one aspect of the problem. Another aspect is finances low budgetary allocation which leads to very poor state of infrastructure of our courts. If you talk about numbers, India spends only about 0.09% of its GDP to maintain the judicial infrastructure. And because of this reason, infrastructure status of lower courts of the country is miserably grim due to which they fail to deliver quality judgments. Then comes the matter of special leave petition cases in the Supreme Court. So some of you might not be aware as to what special leave petition actually is. And so let me briefly describe it to you. So in any legal system, there is a hierarchy of courts and tribunals at different levels. After a judgment has been passed by a court in a hierarchy, any party unsatisfied or aggrieved by the outcome may go for an appeal in the appellate court. For example, if I am a party to a case, the first judgment will come from a lower court. If I am not satisfied with the judgment and if I think that there is a problem with the judgment, I can challenge the decision of the lower court in the high court and then finally I can go into the supreme court to challenge the high court's decision. And the guidelines for the appeal processes have been mentioned from Article 132 to Article 136. But the challenge in the High Court cannot come without the permission of the High Court. And similarly, the challenge in Supreme Court cannot come without either the leave given by High Court or the Supreme Court. So you have to take the permission of the court in order to challenge the decision. But there is a special class of appeals which may not follow the general hierarchy of the courts and tribunals. And Article 136 of the Indian Constitution allows the Supreme Court to grant special leave to appeal against any judgment or order in any matter or case made by any court or tribunal in the country. 
and so if a person is dissatisfied with high court's decision but high court is not giving leave for that judgment to be challenged in supreme court so the person has an option to directly go to the supreme court and supreme court can apply article 136 so that the case directly reaches the supreme court and so increasingly supreme court has started using this provision because of which the number of cases in the supreme court have increased drastically and currently around 40 percent of the cases pending in the supreme court are a result of special leave petitions then another problem with indian courts is the lack of functional cms or court monitoring systems although courts have created dedicated posts for court managers to help improve court operations optimize case movement and monitor the judicial times however only few courts have filled up such posts so far so if you do not have a managerial staff which monitors the timing of each case, keeps a track of cases and what are the problems which a particular case is going to face with respect to witness, with respect to the adjournments and optimizing the movement of the cases in between the courts, you are not going to reduce the pendency anytime soon. After this comes the issue of frequent adjournments in the court. Now, more than 28 years after the Tariq Pe Tariq dialogue in the film Damini encapsulated the common citizen's view on the meandering case trial process, this is still very much our reality. Tariq Pe Tariq has actually become quite a normal thing for our judiciary. The laid down procedure of allowing a maximum of only three adjournments per case is not being followed in over 50% of the matters being heard by courts, leading to rising pendency of the cases. The judges do not look into the reasons behind adjournments. If one of the parties apply for adjournments, they are duly granted. And of course, the next date comes six months or maybe the next year. Then a major cause of pendency is the massive number of cases where the government is party. The data provided by LIMPS or Legal Information Management and Briefing System clearly shows that the center and the states were responsible for over 46% of the pending cases in Indian courts. And now you can clearly see that not all causes of delay come from judiciary itself. Some of the cases are coming from government also because most of the cases are related to service matters. Although separate tribunals have been made, but the decisions of the tribunals are frequently challenged in either the high courts or in the Supreme Court. Then if the government is responsible for 46% of the pending cases, police is also no less responsible because police are quite often handicapped in undertaking effective investigation for want of modern and scientific tools to collect evidences and this flaw on the sides of the police leads to a massive delay especially in criminal cases and then finally no one can deny the fact that with people becoming more aware of their rights and obligations of the state towards them they approach the courts more frequently in case of any violation so not all dimensions related to pending cases are negative. This one aspect is especially positive because it not only shows the increasing trust of the people in our judiciary, but also increasing awareness among the people about the rights and their obligations. So now I guess you have a clear picture about the causes behind the increasing pendency in our judiciary. So why do we treat pendency as such a bad thing? What are the impacts which it causes on the society, on the polity, because of which the pendency in the cases are bad? And of course, the first reason why pendency of such numbers is very bad because of often repeated quote, justice delayed is justice denied. Denial of timely justice amounts to denial of justice itself. Timely disposal of cases is essential to maintain rule of law and provide access to justice. Speedy trial is also a part of right to life and liberty guaranteed under Article 21 of the Constitution. Then it erodes social infrastructure of the country. A weak judiciary has a very negative effect on social development, which leads to lower per capita income, higher poverty rates, higher crime rates and poor public infrastructure. Because if the citizens have to wait for 10 to 20 years to get their rights reinforced or to get the justice in cases where they have been wronged, obviously it means a huge financial burden for these many years, which ultimately will definitely lead to poverty and lower per capita income. The delay in conviction is going to embolden the criminals and so there is no way we can restrain them or discourage them from committing future crimes and so it leads to higher crime rates. 
and if the judgments take around 10 to 20 years this automatically means overcrowding of prisons which are already infrastructure deficient in some cases beyond 150 percent of the capacity this results in gross violation of their human rights because these people are still not convicted but they are under trials and in many cases they spend half of their life behind the bars before being exonerated by the courts and not just the social and political angle it also has an economic dimension in it long pendency in the cases affects the economy of the country as it was estimated that judicial delay cost india around 1.5 percent of its gdp as per the economic survey of 2017-18 pendency hampers dispute resolution contract enforcement discourages investments stalls project hampers tax collection and escalates legal costs which leads to increasing cost of doing business so on one hand government of india is trying to reduce the cost of doing business to increase the ease of doing business and on the other hand the judicial pendency is actually increasing so now you understand why judicial pendency is such a bad thing after having understood the causes and its impact of course, we cannot leave any discussion without providing the solution to a problem. And so when it comes to the solutions as to how to deal with high number of pendency, first and foremost is that we have to improve the infrastructure for quality justice. The Parliamentary Standing Committee, which presented its report on infrastructure development and strengthening of subordinate cases, suggested that state should provide suitable land for construction of new court buildings. New campuses of district court should come up. Then, it also talked about timelines being set for computerization of all the codes as a very, very necessary step towards setting up of e-codes. Then, addressing the issue of vacancy is the next on priority. You, recently have, you must have recently read about appointment of many judges to the Supreme Court as well as High Courts. That was a step in right direction, but here we are mainly focusing on lower courts. And so, the states have to ensure the appointment of the judges is their first priority as far as judicial reforms are concerned. So first and foremost, higher judiciary should focus exclusively on fast pace appointments. At the same time, states should focus upon conducting the judicial services examination every year. When it comes to higher court, the constitution has already provided a mechanism through which a temporary shortage of judges can be overcome by appointment of ad hoc judges. And also, all India judicial services which would benefit the subordinate judiciary by increasing the quality and by timely appointment is the need of the hour. Then there is a need to increase the number of working days. Average annual working days for subordinate court as of now is 244, 190 for Supreme Court and 230 for High Courts. Increasing the number of working days could drastically improve the productivity very significantly. Then there is a need for having a definite time frame to dispose the case by setting annual targets and action plans for the subordinate judiciary and the high courts. At the same time, judicial officers could be issued a strict code of conduct to ensure that the duties are adequately performed by each official. Then of course we need much better court management system and a reliable data collection system. For this, categorization of cases on the basis of urgency and priority along with bunching of cases should be done. So for example, a rape case must be given high priority especially in comparison to cases related to services for example transfers but right now there is no such bunching or prioritization of cases which are done all the cases are treated equally of course it depends upon a personal discretion of judges but there is no institutionalized method of prioritization and bunching which should be implemented but which can be done only when we have computerized all the cases and we have a proper court management system then of course we have talked about the menace of adjournments. We need to strictly deal with Tariq pe Tariq system. We need to strictly regulate the adjournments and imposition of exemplary costs for seeking it on flimsy grounds, especially at the trial stage and not permitting dilution of time frames specified in civil procedure code. And then finally, two solutions are going to go a very very long way in order to reduce the pendency drastically one is the use of information technology solutions and the second is use of alternate dispute resolution mechanisms as far as it solutions are concerned we know that the use of technology for tracking and monitoring cases 
and in providing relevant information to make justice litigant friendly is a very easy way. For example, electronic filing of cases or e-courts are a very welcome step in this direction as they give case status and case history of all pending cases across high courts and subordinate courts, bringing ease of access to information. Similarly, we need to revamp National Judicial Data Grid by introducing a new type of search known as Elasticsearch, which is very very close to artificial intelligence. So as of now, there are a lot of alternate dispute resolution mechanisms active in our country. For example, Lok Adalat should be organized regularly for setting civil and family matters. Gram Nayales as an effective way to manage small claim disputes from rural areas which will help in decreasing the workload of judicial institutions. Apart from that, there are various other kinds of dispute resolution mechanisms, for example, mediation, negotiation, conciliation and arbitration. As you can see on this screen, the differences between them are very clear. And more and more parties should be encouraged to resort to these methods of resolution rather than directly approaching the court system. So now you can clearly see that the fundamental requirement of a good judicial administration is accessibility, affordability and speedy justice, which will definitely not be realized until and unless the justice delivery system is made within the reach of the individual in a time bound manner and within a reasonable cost. And for that, we need to work out on our pendency. From the perspective of mains examination, this is a very important topic. And for that, you need to remember the causes behind the pendency, the statistics behind the pendency, the impact of pendency, and finally, what are the solutions which when followed will lead to drastic reduction in pendency. Page number 8 of today's newspaper presents an item which talks about the great omission in the draft disability policy. Now this topic is important more from the perspective of general studies paper 2 and will come under social justice. As a sub theme we can classify or club this particular article under welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of the population by the center in the states and the performance of such schemes. Now we are aware of the fact that disabled people are a very important piece of Indian population and they have a very positive role to play in the growth and development of the country. Now, in this context, the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities has released a draft of national policy of persons with disability. Now, we need to understand this particular draft, but before moving into the aspect of this draft, we must understand the kind of motivations that has basically led to the national policy or the draft of the national policy for persons with disability. Now, in this context, there are three important additions which have happened in the recent past, which are important from the perspective of examination. Now, you must be aware of the fact that the national policy for persons with disability was adopted way back in 2006. However, we have seen many changes in the recent past. Based on that, this updated draft has been created. The first such motivation can be signing of United Nations Conventions on the Right of People with Disabilities or UNCRPD. Now, this was signed by the Government of India in 2007. So, this has a very strong influence on the draft policy. The second important aspect is there is an enactment of rights of people with disabilities. Now, when we talk about this particular right, uh, this is basically in line with the signing of UNCRPD and this particular enactment took place in the year 2016. The third important aspect is India also became part of the Inchen strategy of for Asian and Pacific decade of person with disabilities and this has been continuing theme from 2013 to 2022. So this is the dominant theme and now one of the things that we must understand that the based on the recommendations or other motivations of these three policy strategies or motivations, the focus of the disability policy now has shifted more from individual towards the society. Now we need to understand earlier the approach towards disability was more towards in terms of medical approach. Now medical approach is always directed towards the individual. But when we look into that aspect of disability, we need to understand that disabled people have to actually live in a society and hence social aspect is a very important aspect. It means that we must focus more on social and human rights. Now this is a theme that we have to understand from the perspective of the new draft policy. 
now if we have understood the basic things we have to move towards the other aspect in this context let's use the following graph now through this diagram we can basically see the basic objective of the draft policy and what are the primary areas in which it is will be operating the first is of course the prevention and early identification the second is of course certification of disability this is a very important aspect and next important aspect is how these people are going to contribute in the society in terms of education health skill development and sports culture and recreation so we'll be talking about each of them but before moving further let's try to understand how and why prevention and early identification are key in this entire policy so first thing first we must understand that whenever we talk about the disabilities most of the disabilities that we see today are preventable through proper immunization now we are aware of the fact that prevention is always better than cure and proper immunization is a system that we can follow so that people with disability do not have to face or rather live a life like a disabled so proper immunization is something which is important second important aspect is many types of disabilities can actually be prevented if we can give proper you know environment and nutrition to mother and child and it can be from the before pregnancy during pregnancy and after the delivery of the child so here mother and child care is a very important aspect to prevent or early identify the disability aspect the third important aspect that we need to understand in terms of prevention early identification is the kind of local infrastructure or local institutional arrangement that we can create so that if in case there is any kind of you know uh, disability that can be taken care of and this can be done if we can strengthen the local health workers village level workers anganwadi workers or even asha workers to actually handle if a person is developing any kind of disability how to handle that so strengthening local institutions is a very important aspect now the next important aspect is certification of disability now if someone is a disabled person someone has actually suffered some kind of problem and has become disabled so now it is important to actually get certification of disability and in this context government of india has created a platform by the name of unique disability identity project this udid is actually an online platform for the application and certification of disability now how this udid is going to work first and foremost the person who is a disabled either him or her or someone who is related can actually apply for certification of disability through udid so this is the first step second step is of course district medical authorities or dmas they have to basically ensure that enough steps are taken so that this certification is made available within 30 days of such application so this is an important aspect third as already mentioned this is basically a part of certification so states have to actually fix one particular day in fortnight for the certification of disability now certification of disability is a very important aspect because people who are disabled get various kinds of benefits only after ascertaining the level of disability or the percentage of disability so in that case certification of disability is key to avail other benefits now once we have created everything then this udid this is going to be a very important aspect udid is going to be linking all service delivery schemes and programs so entire delivery of services whatever these disabled people are going to get or any kind of other things which are going to help them in order to live uh, a life of dignity in the society this will be managed through udid so this is an important aspect so this is the certification of disability now we have actually taken care of two aspect first of course prevention and early identification in which we have identified the people we have taken good care and the next important aspect is certification of disability through udid which will basically ensure that they get all the facilities and services that they are expected to get from the government side now let's focus on education health and skill development apart from that also on sports now as far as education is concerned we all will agree that people with disability will have a very high importance in terms of education now when these people are educated they can positively contribute towards the welfare society plus they can have a dignified life for themselves now in this context the right to education act of 
should be aligned with rights of people with disability act by including specific concern of children with disabilities now here it is very important that when we talk about any kind of disability with children there can be learning disabilities as well now learning disabilities are something which are still to be understood in a proper sense and hence this is an important aspect of this draft now when we talk about these kind of learning disability it means that we have to create a system in which people are aware and sufficient tools are available to help students impart education and knowledge now in this context what is important is that draft policy clearly highlights that there is a need to develop a system to monitor the progress of every child with disability based on learning outcomes so this is an important aspect in terms of education apart from that the government has also mandated that there should be 5% reservation in every government or government aided higher education institution to ensure implementation of 5% reservation of person with disabilities now the important aspect is that as we move towards more towards uh, information technology we also need to understand that for purpose of education e content is very important and this content is important more from the perspective of dissemination of information apart from that people who have special needs people who can't read they can utilize e content for the purpose of acquiring education so this is also made part of this draft policy the next important aspect on which we should talk about or the draft policy basically talks about is the health itself now we can basically understand that all those people who are suffering from disability the health expenditure or expense would be higher and they would require more supports from doctors from practitioners from even medicines so in this aspect the draft policy highlights multiple aspects first and foremost it talks about that people with disability should get health services that are accessible as well as affordable apart from that government has also mandated the department of ayush to conduct research and care activities which are oriented towards engaging the disability more actively so the traditional knowledge and wisdom can also be utilized in order to solve the problems that disabled people are facing the next important aspect is when we talk about the government schemes like ayushman bharat or pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana these should also be aligned with the objectives of rights of people with disabilities act now when we have talked about udid we can actually utilize udid here as well the udid will be used in such a manner so that there can be a common database for people with disabilities under the udid project so common database is also going to help us in ensuring better health facilities for people with disabilities the next important aspect is skill development if we want to give meaningful life or life full of dignity for the people with disabilities we should focus on skill development and in this context government has basically highlighted two important aspect first of course is to create a national level employment portal which is going to help people with disabilities to find right kind of jobs now in this context ministry of labor and employment is basically updating the portal so that the advertisement for people with disabilities can be published here and they can reach out to the best opportunities available for them second uh, whenever people get any kind of employment they need some support afterwards as well so they require better facilities they may require more leaves or they can also have a particular requirement in terms of transfer and posting now in this context the government is basically updating various policy documents so that people with disabilities are treated in a manner which can allow them to work properly and efficiently the next important aspect is to pay attention to the sports culture and recreation activities of people with disabilities and here the government has very clearly specified that dedicated sports facility will be created for people with disabilities so that they can pursue sports or something in which they have active interest and hobby second important aspect is we are aware of the paralympics and other games now these kind of games should be promoted at the village and district level so that more people with disabilities can actually participate and can fulfill their desire to play games and participate in such activity 
लास्ट बट नॉट द लीस्ट देर वी आर स्पेशल फोकस ऑन दिव्य कला शक्ति विच इज मोर ऑफ अ कल्चरल इवेंट एंड द कल्चरल इवेंट इज बेसिकली डन सो दैट देर कैन बी अ पॉजिटिव एटीट्यूड क्रिएटेड इन पीपल विद डिसबिलिटीज सो दे फील कनेक्टेड टू द सोसाइटी इन लार्ज सो दीज आर द वेरियस स्टेप्स और इनिशिएटिव विच आर मैंशन द ड्राफ्ट पॉलिसी विच आर एक्चुअली गोइंग टू हेल्प पीपल विद डिसबिलिटीज टू लिव अ लाइफ ऑफ मीनिंग पर्पज एंड डिग्निटी Page number one of today's newspaper presents an article which talks about fiscal deficit reined in, current account deficit a concern. Now, as far as this topic is concerned, uh, I believe that all of you are aware of the fact that finance minister has highlighted that the government would take necessary measures to control fiscal deficit. This is an important aspect, and uh, the current account deficit has reached to an unprecedented level, uh, especially in the month of June. The current account deficit was standing at twenty six point two. billion us dollars which is very high now in this concern this topic is not important that much in terms of the perspective of prelims what is important from the perspective of prelims is to understand what is the meaning of pro cyclical fiscal policy and counter cyclical fiscal policy now we will try to understand how this basically works so pro cyclic means in accordance to the cycle counter cyclic means in a opposition to the cycle and which cycle are we are talking about we are talking about business cycle now let us try to understand that uh, whether we talk about counter cyclical or pro cyclical fiscal policy what they basically are uh, the purpose of doing this so the purpose is very clear the government wants to counter boom or recession through fiscal measures so we will write here now let us take an example of counter cyclical fiscal policy so when we talk about counter cyclic it means that it is goes against the cycle now suppose this is a graph in which we can see that there is a business cycle that we have drawn so there is a business cycle which first goes up and then down so this is like boom phase and this is the recession phase so there should be certain elements in terms of how the government is going to use various fiscal measures to basically give a direction to its policy so how they are going to work out let's try to understand suppose uh, there is a recession going on so this is the recession so let's highlight the recession phase in say red color and this is the recession phase where we are going on and now whenever there is a recession in economy what are the unique features first of course demand must be slowing down so slow demand is the first feature of recession this is why we are writing in the bottom side of this particular graph the second important aspect is when the demand is slowing it means growth will fall so falling growth should be the second important aspect now if we are into this kind of a situation where demand is slowing down and the growth rate is falling how the government can use counter cyclical measures to actually help the economy to revive now in this context let's focus upon this particular aspect when we are talking about counter cyclic fiscal policy it definitely goes against the business cycle now business cycle is moving towards what it is moving towards recession now what the government should do if we are going for a counter uh, aspect considering in terms of handling the recession so we are trying to handle recession government should increase money supply now when you are going to increase money supply what will happen first and foremost it will help the people to have more money which they can spend and if we, if the government wants to ensure more money in the hands of people how we are going to do that first foremost we can actually reduce tax so when you reduce tax it means less of the money will be transferred from people to the government so the capacity to absorb money will be limited so people will be having more money what is the second method with what what the government can actually adopt to the second method can be to increase expenditure from the side of the government it means the government is spending more money and when the government is spending more money again the situation will happen where there will be more money available with people and hence money supply will increase it means when money supply is increase so there is a chance that the demand which is slowing down now this demand the slowness of demand is actually countered and the growth rate once the demand goes up the growth rate can be positive in the direction so this is the counter cyclic method in order to handle various situations so this is one of the situations this is handling of recession 
second if there is an inflation going on what is the step of counter cyclical fiscal policy so first let's understand what the government must do if we are going to control inflation it means we should reduce the supply of money amongst the people so what we are going to do we are going to reduce our expenditure this is the important aspect and second is increase the tax rate so that we can absorb extra money which is causing huge inflation from the public so this is what the government will be doing and such impact have what money supply reduces in this fashion what will happen the inflation is control now when we are adopting this system what will happen it will be having a more balanced output as well because it will promote growth during recession or it will reduce the rate of inflation to stable level so this is something which the government is trying to do in this mechanism now let us try to understand how pro cyclical fiscal policy is going to work or operate in similar scenario so suppose we are looking into the same aspect again the same aspect of uh, recession so recession means again slowing of demand uh, falling of growth this is happening now in such a scenario when the economy is facing a recession what is in your opinion the government should do the government should actually increase the money supply but what government does government basically increases tax rates and decreases expenditure so this is what the government does and through this mechanism what is the output the money supply is reduced so in terms of pro cyclic means whatever is happening we are trying to actually further manifest or further expand the impact so what is going to happen this is going to happen for recession money supply will be increasing now the second important aspect if we look into the inflation if we are going for pro cyclical fiscal policy what government should do government should definitely decrease the money supply but what government actually does because they are trying to go in accordance to the business cycle in they end up increasing their expenditure and decreasing their tax rates and again what happens the money supply increases so in terms of this entire output what will happen it prolongs the effect of whatever we are going forward in terms of recession or this increases the rate of inflation now in the economic system what we can normally understand now that the counter cyclical fiscal policy is more balanced approach that the government can adopt and why this is a balanced approach because now government will be controlling the macro factors which will be more of the physical measures to give more stability in the phase where we are into so this is what the important aspect is and that you should keep in mind now you can expect a question on this in the prelims examination as well so you should actually have a very clear cut idea that how pro cyclical fiscal policy operates either in recession or inflation and how the effect that basically comes out page number 4 of today's newspaper presents a news item which talks about tribals at the top great expectations on the ground now you must be aware of the fact that ms dropdi murmu who is expected to become the 15th president of india and she comes from santhal community now this actually shows the kind of uh, vibrant democracy that we have that even people from shidul tribe community can reach to top positions in india now upsc definitely uses this kind of information to basically ask questions on other related aspects and in this context we must know more about santhal community now when we talk about santhal community there are few things basic that you must understand first and foremost they are found in three states which are primarily jharkhand odisha and west bengal now if we look into the native area where they are normally found they are after their settlement of course they are normally found in the chhota nagpur plateau region so this is where the santhal community is found now the second important aspect is santhal as a word has a particular meaning as well this means someone who is very calm or peace loving so this is the meaning of the word santhal apart from that they speak a language which is called as santhali language and the santhali language is basically part of the schedule 8 so this is one of the 22 languages that are there in our indian languages so this is an important aspect that you must keep in mind now there is one interesting aspect about the santhali language as well we when we talk about santhali language it is written in a particular script and that script is called as olchiki so the spelling is o l c h i 
K.I. And a very important person whom you can actually refer to for Old Chiki is Pandit Raghunath Marmu. Now when we talk about Santhals, we must also talk about comparing Santhals with other tribal communities of the region. Now when you talk about uh, demography, in terms of demography, this is the third largest tribal group after Bheel and Gonds. So the largest group in this case, of course, is Gonds, then Bheels, and then comes Santhals. So these are very important pieces of information that you may utilize from the perspective of prelims examination as well and keep this thing handy. Now when you talk about the, this community of Santhal, there are people who have achieved great feats and here we must highlight the name of Mr. Heman Suren who is a Santhali and is a Jharkhand Chief Minister. Apart from that, former Comptroller and Auditor General of India Mr. Girish Chand Marmu also belong to the same community or tribal group. Now Santhali community, the society is a vibrant and dynamic one and here one interesting aspect that you must be aware of that widow remarriage is also practiced and apart from that even when this community is a tribal community divorce is not rare so you can also find divorce taking place in this community so these are the important aspect in terms of the society now as far as professions are concerned we are aware of the fact that they are tribal community and hence most of the people are engaged in the occupation of agriculture and many of them are also engaged in forest related activities now these are the ways in which these people actually lead their life they have a very simple lifestyle and this is important from the perspective of the ups examination now when we talk about the art forms we also should pay attention to the kind of work that they do so they use various kinds of instruments these instruments are kamak dhol sarangi and flutes and their households or the places where they live are called as ola and they have a very distinct feature in their houses the outer walls when we talk about they have three color pattern and this three color pattern has a significance as well which is the order and that order is very interesting the bottom portion is painted in the black soil the middle is painted in the white soil and the top layer is painted in the red which shows the vibrancy of the Santhal community. So how they basically pay attention to everything that is important for their life and livelihood. Now when we are going to talk about Santhal community, we should also talk about the Santhal revolt of 1855 and 56, just the precursor of 1857 revolt and this is a very important aspect of Indian history. Now we are aware of the fact that once the British got economic control of Bengal, Bihar and Odisha, they wanted to run the entire mechanism to suit their interest and maximize their land revenue. In this context, what British tried to do? They wanted to implement permanent settlement in this particular region under Lord Cornwallis. So this is important factual information. Next important is that they invited people from Santhal community to settle in a particular area, which is called as Damineko in Raj Mahal Hills. But Santhals, they were not happy with the kind of exploitation that was meted out to them through Zamidars and English police. So what happened? In June 1855, two Santhal leaders, Siddhu and Kanu Murmu, they declared a rebellion against the East India Company and farmers, villagers and women took wide participation. Now this, now this movement is very important and this movement basically made British think twice about how they are going to control Indian population. The Santhal community basically fought the police and they damaged communication system and used guerrilla warfare. Now when British who wanted to actually curb this rebellion, they followed very barbaric system to curb this rebellion and they used martial law to curb the rebellion which was successful in January 1856. So this is a very important aspect. The leaders are very important, the regions are very important, the purpose is very important and the note of uh, DNS notes of today are having important piece of information about Santhal revolt keep these things handy and revise on a weekly basis. With this, we have come to the question of the day. But before moving forward, let's discuss the answer of the previous day, that is 14th of July. The question is, consider the following statements regarding Directorate of Revenue Intelligence. Statement 1, it is a statutory body and second, it works under Ministry of Home. Now we have to identify the correct statements, but incidentally, 
both the statements are wrong. It is not a statutory body and does not work under Ministry of Home. So the correct answer is option D. With this, let's move to the question of the day for today, that is 15th of July 2022. With respect to counter cyclical fiscal policy, consider the following statement. Statement 1 is This policy is normally adopted to promote economic growth when the economy is facing recession. Second, upon the adoption of this policy, the money supply always increases. And we have to identify the correct statements. Option A is 1 only, option B is 2 only, option C is both 1 and 2, and option D is neither 1 nor 2. So do attempt this question and put your answers in the comment box so that all of us can basically learn something good.